Hi friends, uh, let's talk about the questions that came in FMG December 2021 in orthopedics. When I look at the first question, it reads like this. A patient with a road traffic accident has a fracture of the shaft of humerus. After injury, he was not able to dorsiflex the wrist. Friends, this is dorsiflexion of the wrist. This is palmar flexion of the wrist. So he is not able to dorsiflex or extend the wrist. If you are not able to extend the wrist, it means that your wrist extensors are gone. What is the nerve responsible for wrist extension or dorsiflexion? Radial nerve. So your radial nerve is gone. And the question was, he was advised as a splint which is shown here. They had shown the image of the splint. And what is the splint doing? Trying to put your wrist into extension. So this is wrist splint, wrist drop, cock up splint. Let us look at all the important nerves and their splint. Around the shoulder, you have the brachial plexus injuries around the cervical brachial corridor. In the brachial plexus injuries, which is C5, C7, C5, C6, C7, C8 and T1 nerve roots, C5 and C6 are the commonest ones to be involved. And they cause problems with shoulder abduction and elbow flexion. So in such cases, the splint given is that you place into abduction and elbow flexion. It's like an aeroplane. So this splint was called as aeroplane splint. So around shoulder, that's the position in which you give the splints, aeroplane splint. Now they are not being very commonly used, but classically are sometimes. The second is humerus, the radial nerve, wrist drop, cock up splint. Third is around the elbow behind medial epicondyle, the ulna nerve. Now the lumbricals, there are four lumbricals. The first two lumbricals are supplied by the median nerve. The second two are supplied by the ulna nerve. First, second are the median nerve. Third and fourth are by the ulna nerve. The action of lumbricals is to make an L in your hand. L, lumbricals, L for lumbricals. If the lumbricals are paralyzed, there will be a claw hand, hyperextension of metacarpophalangeal joint, flexion of interphalangeal joint. This is claw hand. And what is the aim of applying any splint to a claw hand? You replicate the action of lumbricals, make a L again. And when you make this L, you're bending the knuckles, so called as knuckle bender splint which is used for claw hand. But if you have to choose ulnar claw hand more than the median claw hand. And if all the four lumbricals are gone, total claw hand. So partial claw hands are ulnar or median. If it is not mentioned, then ulnar more than median. If they show the image, you will choose the same. Total claw hand, all the four fingers gone, right? And then you have a thomas splint that we'll talk later. The next nerve. The next nerve that can be damaged is the posterior interosseous nerve around the head of radius. It will cause a finger drop. Posterior interosseous nerve supplies the finger extensors. The wrist extensors are supplied by the radial nerve. So the finger drop is posterior interosseous nerve. Around the hip on the posterior border of acetabulum travels the sciatic nerve and hip dislocations will damage the sciatic nerve. And then around the knee, neck of fibula is the common peroneal nerve. Knee damages causes the damage to this nerve. And they usually present with a foot drop. So these are the different nerves which are damaged in human body that you must remember. Most common damage nerve is the radial nerve. And the splint for it is cock up splint. Friends, if you look at the next question, I have already answered this. This is showing you the clawing of the last digits, the last two digits, the third and the fourth lumbricals are gone. Which nerve is involved? Ulna nerve. And which splint will be given for it? Knuckle bender splint. In the last question, there was one more splint being mentioned. There was a Thomas splint. Friends, the Thomas splint is a splint which was initially described for the tuberculosis of the knee joint but now is commonly used to immobilize the lower limbs for transport. So that's a splint which was described by H. 
O. Thomas, Sir H. O. Thomas has been a great scientist and he has been called as the father of British orthopedics. The father of orthopedics, if you talk about, so overall, the father is Nicholas Andre. But if they don't mention Nicholas Andre, H. O. Thomas is the second best name to be taken off. The next question, if I look at a young male presented with pain and swelling around the wrist joint, there is no history of injury, x ray is shown. So, what do you see? You see a lesion at the lower end of radius. The lesion is going till the joint and there are multiple septa in it. This is classically called as soap bubble appearance. Going till the end of a bone, in fact, it usually goes till the joints. In a skeletally mature individual, so lytic lesion towards the lower end of radius is GCT, giant cell tumor, joint, giant, giant cell tumor going till the joint till proved otherwise. So GCT is the classical image shown here. Remember the most common site for GCT is lower end femur. But it's the other way around. If they show you the lower end of radius with a lytic lesion, think of GCT. Lower end femur, lots of things can happen. But that's the commonest site for giant cell tumor. And the lower end of radius giant cell GCT, giant cell tumor, the image shown here is the number one image asked in the entrance exams in India, in all 19 subjects, very commonly asked. Friends, remember few of the lines that can help you in your FMG exams. Number one, single central cavity. with a bony fragment in it. Simple bone cyst or unicameral bone cyst. Usually they will show you upper and humerus. Night pain, decreased on taking salicylates. Friends, Osteoid osteoma. Metaphyseal lesion with sun ray appearance, which is a type of a periosteal reaction, usually the second decade of life, osteosarcoma. Diaphyseal lesion with onion peel appearance can be second or first decade of life, Ewing sarcoma. These four scenarios are asked, but the king is giant cell tumor. Remember that. Question number four A patient was diagnosed as a case of supraspinatus tendonitis. What degrees and what movement of shoulder will be painful? Remember, the rotator cuff muscles, supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor, small t, and small s, subscapularis. These three, they insert on greater tuberosity, and subscapularis inserts on the lesser tuberosity. They are the abductions and external rotation and subscapularis is internal rotator of the shoulder. Supraspinatus out of them will do abduction for the first 0 to 15 degrees. So if it is inflamed, this 0 to 15 degrees of shoulder abduction is affected. That's your answer here. Question number five. A person is sitting in the front car, front seat of a car, has an accident. So when you're sitting in the front seat of a car, your knee will strike against the 
dashboard and when there's a striking against the dashboard if that impact goes in the line of femur it will dislocate the femur and it will go posteriorly so that's called as a dashboard injury with posterior dislocation of the hip and if the impact goes on tibia it will avulse the posterior cruciate ligament from the posterior margin of the tibia so these are the dashboard injuries so the history is of a dashboard injury his lower limb is in flexion adduction internal rotation so adduction towards the midline and then you can see that this is an acetabulum here the femoral head is inside here it's outside but it's at the level of the joint or above the joint so you have an adducted thigh you have the head out of the socket of the acetabulum and friends you can see the lesser trochanter here but you can't see it here it means it's internally rotated when you see more or lesser trochanter it means external rotation and when it's less it means internal rotation so you have flexion adduction internal rotation what's the diagnosis remember this golden table which i'm telling you if you have abduction whether you have shoulder or you have hip if the limb lengthens and if the head is below the joint whether is the femoral head or the humeral head you are talking about anterior dislocations and remember shoulder usually goes anteriorly and to be very specific in the hip you will have flexion abduction external rotation these three as a component of deformity with lengthening friends in contrast to it if you have adduction and internal rotation plus limb by the body you are talking about posterior dislocation of shoulder which is the commonest missed dislocation the signs are so subtle but if you compare this with flexion adduction internal rotation of the hip plus limb is shortened plus head at or above the joint you are talking about the most common dislocation of the hip joint posterior dislocation shoulder is the most common joint to dislocate it is dislocated anteriorly all of the joints they usually go posterior so when i look at the previous question here in the previous question when i look at in the previous question they have shown you there is head at or above there is adduction so this is posterior dislocation one more thing i want you to remember the femoral artery crosses the head of femur anteriorly here when it crosses anteriorly because the head is not in the acetabulum you will not feel the femoral artery pulsations in a posterior dislocation so this is called as vascular sign of narath and vascular sign of narath is positive in posterior dislocation of the hip joint means you will not feel the pulsation in positive so normally it's negative when you feel the pulsations so positive vascular sign of narath posterior dislocation most common dislocation of the hip posterior dislocation adducted thigh after an accident think of posterior dislocations fractures usually will cause abduction anterior dislocation will cause abduction extrusions an elderly male presented with multiple bone pains with renal failure protein loss high calcium remember when you have high calcium when you have multiple bone pains 
and if your ESR is very high, usually more than 100, in an elderly patient, you think about nothing but multiple myeloma. And here they have shown an X-ray which has multiple punched out lytic lesions, classical of multiple myeloma. Hyperparathyroidism will cause dot, 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 dot on the skull, which is like salt and pepper. And carcinoma prostrate will have osteoblastic bone forming mats, not the lytic lesion which are shown here. This is what you should remember. Now they had shown an image of a foot and they had marked this bone. And they had asked you what is it. So friends remember one thing. I will like you to remember four things here. Since this is the great toe, in the line of the great toe, a bone which is boat shaped is the navicular. Navicular is also called as a scaphoid of the foot. Scaphoid means a boat, the same. Their shape is almost the same. The joint, the bone that goes and joins with it, articulates with it, forms the joint called as talonavicular. This is the joint here. The bone which goes on the lateral border of the foot is the cuboid and with it articulating is the calcaneum, calcaneum cuboid. These four bones we must remember. These are the cuneiforms. medial, intermediate and lateral cuneiforms. But the four tarsal bones which I have told you are very, very important for you to remember. And they had marked the navicular which was the answer in this question. And then the last one, which artery is palpated behind medium medialis? Answer is posterior tibial because it just crosses behind the medium medialis. In the first web space on the dorsum of the foot, we have dorsal spedis artery. Around the Radial styloid, we have the radial artery. Around the head of femur, we have the femoral artery. These are the arteries that you must remember. So these were the questions which were asked to you in FMG December 2021 in orthopedics. The paper was standard, classical images, good concepts. I hope this video is useful to you. All the very best. Thank you very much.